Okay guys, in this video segment we're going to talk about the beginning parts of Unit 5, which is all about bonding theory. Okay, uh, Unit 5 has Chapter 7 and 8 in it. Um, chapter 7 is very short. It deals with ionic and metallic bonding. And then we spend about three weeks on Chapter 8, which is all about molecular geometry, molecular bonding, which is a much longer uh, portion of this unit. So let's start off here talking about our uh, bonding theory. And we're going to go right into uh, Chapter 7 stuff, which is ionic compounds. Now, ionic compounds, um, when you work with them, you've got to remember that to get ions, you need to have charge. So you need to have a positive side and a negative side to form a bond. So when we're dealing with ionic compounds, we need to have a metal bonded to a non-metal. Okay? Uh, so all ionic compounds, you're looking for that metal, which is on the left-hand side of our stair-step line, to the, that non-metal or group of non-metals, which is on the right-hand side of our stair-step line. Now, when you work with ionic compounds, we have to review a couple of concepts that we've talked about in previous years and actually in previous units here uh, in our class. The first one is valence electrons. Remembering that valence electrons are those outermost energy level electrons. Now, within valence electrons, recall that always will include your S and P orbital electrons. It does not include the D or F because D and F are always one step behind that S and P in terms of how they fill and those, those fill patterns. So we're dealing with the s orbital and the p orbital so we're dealing with the maximum number of eight valence electrons that we can have in those outer energy levels so that brings us down to this idea of the octet rule when you have an, the rule for a rule of eight or the octet rule is really telling us that to be a stable atom everything wants to add up to eight valence electrons or eight outer electrons most atoms don't have that naturally our noble gases do they are already a p2 or sorry, they're already an S2P6, meaning that they have a stable configuration. Every other atom on the periodic table is trying to get to that point, or they're trying to find ways to bond, transfer electrons, share electrons, do something so they can actually have this full outer energy level, which we designate as S2P6. Now, for ionic compounds, they do that through ionization. Ionization is basically the transfer of electrons, okay? So we're not sharing here, so make sure you underline the word transfer or kind of put that one to memory um, because when you ionize, you're moving an electron from one atom to the other atom. Um, what that does is an atom that has too many electrons, it reduces them down so they have the right number of eight, and for those who don't have enough, they gain them to get to the right number of eight. Now, when we deal with ionic compounds, we have some properties that we can identify with them. The first is that ionic compounds tend to be hard, but brittle, okay? So ionic compounds lock into what we call a crystal lattice. It's where they actually have a repeating pattern of their formula over and over and over again. That locking pattern makes them very hard, but also makes them very brittle. It also gives ionic compounds their strength. Now, because of that locking pattern, ionic compounds really can't conduct electricity in a solid state. Um, there's no movable electrons there. There's no way for things to flow. However, if you put them in solution or if you liquefy them, they can conduct electricity. Okay? That's going to be different than molecules, which we'll talk about later, where molecules do not conduct electricity in any state. But for ionic compounds, you have to be in solution or liquid. Now, being in solution, we're basically saying it's being dissolved. Okay? Um, the reason why is when ionic compounds dissolve, they actually break apart into their separate ions. So you actually have floating around, able to flow, positive charge and negative charge within a solution. So when you dissolve something in water, we call that being in solution. And when ionic compounds do it, they do it so they actually have this um, charge to it, a positive side and a negative, that are able to move or flow. Now another benefit of having this strong crystal lattice is that they have really high melting points. So of all the different types of compounds or different substances we have, ionic compounds have the highest of the melting points. Um, your lowest will be molecules. In the middle is your alloys and metallic structures. And then at the highest are ionic compounds. Again, it comes from that repeating pattern. So if we take a look, here's what a crystal lattice kind of looks like. Um, and it, here's an example of a two-dimensional view of it for sodium chloride, or just table salt. Notice how you have sodium, then chlorine, sodium, then chlorine, sodium, chlorine, sodium, chlorine, and it repeats the pattern. Now, the overall ratio is a one-to-one. -one. That's why we say the formula or the formula unit for sodium chloride is just NaCl. 
But in reality, it isn't just pa little packets of NaCl randomly put together. It's a repeating pattern of one-to-one -one ratio, back and forth, back and forth, that locks the ionic compound into this really strong lattice. Now, if you take a look, here's a three-dimensional look at that same idea. If you notice, these corners out here where these sodiums are sitting, these purple ones, that's where the, the crystal lattice is its weakest because this is the point where it doesn't have as many things attached to it. So this is the point where water can come in and attack this and dissolve this away. Or this is where it will break or cleave or that kind of stuff. Now, not all crystal lattices are perfect squares like sodium chloride is. Um, if we actually go back to this picture, we'll notice that sodium chloride, this is not cut. These are probably chipped or broken off of a bigger piece. And when they break, they break in these really rigid 90 degree angle, like rectangular type of shapes. And that's because when you have the sodium chloride crystal, it breaks that way. Now, if you remember, you probably have talked about crystals before. Crystal size, crystal strength, cleavage, how strong they are, how easily they break, angles to them. And those, that kind of stuff probably came from earth science class. Well, earth science, you guys gave ionic compounds a different name. You called them minerals. Whereas in our class, ionic compounds, we just call, um, we call them ionic compounds. But really, a mineral is a natural occurring ionic compound. Okay? So they all have their different crystals to them or crystal acids to them. Here's another one. It has more of a hexagon shape to it. Uh, if you guys remember, calcite was another mineral you talked about that had kind of a sloping or an angle shape to it. You kind of see an angle coming across here on that. Uh, again, this is much more angular compared to the sodium chloride or the salt that's over here. Okay, We're not going to go into the details of all the different crystals. That's more of an earth science topic. But that connection between that ionic compounds really are different types of minerals is something I wanted to make. Now, when you take a look at ionic crystals, here's a quick video that will show you actually ionic crystals growing. Pay attention that when they grow, they don't grow as blobs. They actually grow in that same repeating pattern as we go through. So that kind of comes from a website called beautifulchemistry.net, and what they did is they used high-definition cameras shot at really high speeds uh, to show that crystal formation, which is pretty cool to see. Um, when we look at ionic compounds, the next thing we need to talk about is how do we actually get them to bond together, okay? So what actually goes on there in that transfer of electrons? So what we see, if we go up to sodium chloride here, if we do the Bohr model of the atom showing these rings and showing these electrons, that outer energy level, sodium has one valence electron. Well, chlorine has seven. So if sodium has an extra one and chlorine is missing one, what happens is that the sodium, if it collides with the chlorine, can give that electron over to chlorine. Um, I say give, but in reality, you need to put some energy in to make that happen. Now, if that happens, we see that sodium gets smaller, chlorine gets a little bigger, and now chlorine has the electron. But because sodium is now a cation, or positively charged, and chlorine is now called chloride as an anion, what we get is an effect that we have a positive side and we have a negative side. When you have a positive side and a negative side, they attract each other. That attraction is the ionic bond. It's that simple. The attractive force between positive and negative creates what we call the ionic bond. Okay. Now, it isn't always as clean as NaCl where it's a one-to-one -one ratio. Okay. Sometimes you don't have as good of setup. So, for example, down here, calcium has two extra electrons, so it has to donate both. It won't just donate one. It's either two or nothing for calcium. It's like, I want them both gone because I want to be down a level to be more stable. But chlorine only wants one. So in these scenarios, it's kind of like going to a baseball game, going to a Twins game, you're walking in the stadium, and all, you have all your scalpers out there saying, two tickets, two tickets, two tickets. If you walk up to one of those scalpers and they're trying to sell two tickets, you say, I'll take one, they're going to tell you no. They're going to tell you, beat it. Um, 
because they want to sell things in pairs because it's going to have a hard time for them to sell a single ticket after they sell the one. So um, calcium is kind of like that scalper. He's got two tickets to sell, and he won't sell them unless he sells both of them. So if you want to go to the game, you got to call up a buddy and say, hey, can you come to down to the game with me? I'll buy you a, a soda at the game, and um, we'll go to the game together. So your buddy comes down. You take one of the tickets. He takes the other ticket, or in this case, electrons. And then Calcium's happy because he got rid of those two extra electrons. You both are happy. You gained one. Get to go watch the Twins play and hopefully win. So that is uh, how it kind of works. Now, what would happen if we had the ratio between aluminum and oxygen? Okay, and to do this one, I'm going to go to the board. So with aluminum and oxygen, aluminum has three valence electrons in group 13. Or oxygen, it has two spots that are open. It wants to gain two electrons. So aluminum wants to give away three, oxygen wants to gain two. So if you take a look, the least common multiple between 2 and 3 is 6, which means that aluminum is going to have to give up 6, and oxygen is going to have to gain 6 to make this work. So for aluminum, it takes 2 of them, and for oxygen, it takes 3 of them to make this work. So what happens is the aluminum then can donate 1, 2, 3, 4, five, six. So for something like this, which we would call aluminum oxide, we get a two to three ratio. So then if we had that ratio, we can write the formula that aluminum has two of them for every oxygen needing three. So that's why we get these subscripts down here, is that ratio. Okay, so that's ionic bonding. In our next unit, we will spend a lot more time looking at how ions bond and these ratios and naming them and those kind of things. Okay, that's going to end the video, guys, here. Uh, the next segment will go into metallic properties. Thank you.